Hello and welcome to the Pedra Molusca mini-series, Advances in Understanding and Managing Molluscum in Children, sponsored by Novan. In episode one, you'll hear from Dr. Nanette Silverberg. Dr. Silverberg is clinical professor of dermatology and pediatrics at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. She's chief of pediatric dermatology at Mount Sinai Health System and director of pediatric and adolescent dermatology. She recently completed her position as chair for Pedra's Skin of Color and Pigmentary Disorders Focus Study Group. Welcome, Dr. Silverberg. Thank you for having me. Uh, so molluscum is a topic uh, dear to my heart. Uh, I started doing research in molluscum as a fellow uh, in pediatric dermatology. And um, I think that there's a lot of excitement around molluscum now as we start to enter the era where we have FDA approved medications. This talk is called Molluscum the Lowdown. These are my disclosures um, and these are not related to um, molluscum topic uh, except for Verica. Um, molluscum is the scourge of fill in your own town. Every place I've practiced, people have been affected by molluscum. Uh, and, and I think that that is the, um, the major um, idea that molluscum is uh, fairly universal now for children uh, in all uh, locations, in all uh, socioeconomic groups, races, ethnicities. Um, it is something that is easily transmitted from child to child uh, and every child is at risk. Molluscum contagiosum virus is a pox virus. It's in that family of pox viruses with uh, smallpox, so it, it is a double-stranded, brick-shaped DNA pox virus. However, unlike smallpox, it can only go skin deep, so it can't invade deeper uh, into the body. Um, it will not go below the skin. There is a bimodal peak of onset uh, starting in toddler years or preschool years, around three to four years of age, and we'll see why um, I give that range later. There's some uh, another peak that occurs. It's a little smaller around school age children. Um, those are usually kids who are starting to swim and get exposed in pools. Uh, and then after that, there's a steady state uh, of uh, molluscum occurring through childhood into adolescence and then early adulthood. Um, as we go uh, past the age of 15, uh, we start to see a shift. Uh, from MCV1, molluscum contagio, uh, contagiosum virus type 1, uh, to type 2, which is the sexually transmitted type. Molluscum is contagious when wet. 64% uh, of kids swam before onset in a survey. Two-thirds of kids report co-bathing. It's bathing with a sibling or a friend. And many report daycare attendance and shared potties. And this is often why we see molluscum in the lower extremity in small kids. Another source of transfer for molluscum is fomites on shared towels or bath equipment. So we always say everybody gets their own towel, their own bath equipment, and don't share. Locations are pretty common uh, for or toddlers on the legs and popliteal region. Again, it's that potty distribution or sitting on the side of a, of a small pool. School-age children tend to get molluscum on the axilla and trunk from pulling themselves up on the side of a pool, although they will get in other parts of the body as well, including the legs. We can see certain kids will develop uh, atopic dermatitis or eczema as a result of molluscum. And that will often occur in areas that are already prone to atopic dermatitis, such as the popliteal region or the antecubital region. Molluscum can also occur on the mucosa, such as the con conjunctiva, which can cause conjunctivitis, uh, and it can occur in the oral mucosal surface. Molluscum are often described by their morphology as pearly papules with a central del. The DEL is really not visible in small children because it's milli, uh, so we say it's milli-like, it's very small. You really have to magnify it quite extensively to see uh, the DEL on something that's under a millimeter. We can see it on certain locations, so that can be on the eyelids. It's not just pediatric, but you know, it is sometimes the uh, morphology is a little different there. Um, we can see umbilicated nodular lesions. Uh, those can mimic uh, cysts or tumors. Big or giant molluscum are often seen on bottom of the feet. Um, we'll see them also in uh, smaller kids in the diaper region and in the intergluteal port uh, area. Uh, and they can mimic condyloma in that location. 
Um, they can be conglomerated so that they look like one big plaque um, mimicking a herpetic appearance. They can be erythematous uh, and look like a spitz nevus. Uh, they can be inflamed and look like an abscess um, or be an abscess. Uh, and they can also be pedunculated. Meloscum is a great mimicker in pediatric dermatology. And it will look like other conditions. So we've mentioned some of them. Uh, of course, we're seeing dermatitis in about a quarter of kids, um, but up to half of kids will develop atopic dermatitis um, when they are exposed to molluscum. Um, we can see id reactions, that's that inflammatory papular reaction on the extremities that, occur, that occurs um, when kids start to develop an immune response. You can see erythema multiforme like at molluscum, which is molluscum in the center, the halo around it, and then the real redness at the edge. Uh, so those three zones, but the central zone is the molluscum. Again, we talked about how it looks like acne, milia, cysts, um, but it can mimic infections. And we've had kids here um, uh, admitted to the hospital thinking that they had uh, infections like Lyme disease or herpes or uh, abscesses or condyloma. And it, it behooves us to take a look with a magnifier and look for these molluscum um, and to help help people um, come to this diagnosis. Uh, it can also look like viral exanthem. So when molluscum lines up in an, in an axilla and then the dermatitis around the area starts spreading, it can mimic a, a unilateral lateral thoracic exanthem. Uh, and Giannotti crusty like lesions have been uh, uh, reported. Um, and that can also look like the id reaction as well. Um, we have seen in our own meetings some discussion of uh, molluscum being parts of uh, immunodeficiency syndromes, both iatrogenic and congenital, like the X Men syndrome. Uh, and we have to think of that as well when we see uh, extensive molluscum. So, again, we talked about milia lesions on the head and neck in young kids can mimic acne or perioral dermatitis. Um, what is most impressive about molluscum in younger kids is that it's contagious to parents and siblings. And while I've only had probably a dozen parents who've caught from kids through the past decades, uh, kids catch from each other all the time. We say up to 45% of um, kids will, will have reported ha having caught from a sibling. Uh, the lower chin and neck um, can be a parent, place a parent will catch from hugging. You can see this little child over here nuzzling in uh, with their parent um, and unfortunately giving them a little moscum. Uh, and then giant or intratriginous, we've discussed already. The boat sign is the beginning of the end. And um, when we start to see a really strong dermatitis around the molluscum lesions, we may start to see some fading of the molluscum or reduction in their size um, as that occurs. And that is the beginning of the end. Sometimes that looks miserably itchy or is miserably itchy. Um, and it, it is important for us to treat those kids symptomatically to be more comfortable. Um, and uh, the boat sign has to be distinguished from uh, in Patigo. So two centers in Jerusalem, Israel, have uh, had uh, looked at their uh, cases of, uh, the bo of boat sign versus in Patigo. They had 56 kids um, who were uh, suspected as having uh, infections because of the swelling in the area. Uh, mean age at presentation was 4.6 years. Fever was reported in 12.5%. Uh, and actually 62.5% received antibiotics. Um, when they cultured them, 55% had sterile cultures or commensals, and seven had positive cultures. So that's uh, some of them didn't receive cultures at all. So no, no statistical difference was observed between the patients with pathogenic isolates and patients with sterile or non-pathogenic uh, cultures in terms of demographics. Um, it is really sometimes hard to distinguish, um, and we do have to keep a fair amount of uh, concern um, for uh, potentially for a secondary super infection in our kids. Here's a, a demonstration of erythema multiforme like dermatitis. Again, our little central, uh, central molluscum and then zone of clearance and zone of erythema. Again, here's our Giannotti crusty like uh, molluscum dermatitis over the extensor extremities. So molluscum has a reason that lingers. So we usually say um, when we think about molluscum that about 20% will be gone 
at a six month time period, about 50% at a year, about 70% at a year and a half. And we approach 90% by two years, but we do have some kids who linger uh, beyond the two year mark. And a part of the reason we see that is molluscum has virulence factors that helps um, the virus evade immune response. Um, those are protein products that are produced and there are more than 20 of them, but we'll just mention a few that have be recently been discussed, including the MC005 and MC132, which inhibit NF kappa beta. Um, the reason that's really important to me um, is that in looking at old studies of tacrolimus, there was a hint in those studies that there may be a worsening of molluscum spread or of lesions um, with tacrolimus topically. And that, inhib that, that is something that affects the NF kappa beta cycle. So it could be that the molluscum um, was interacting with that or preventing the tacrolimus from working and the tacrolimus was preventing the molluscum from clearing one of those. So MC159, MC160 and MC163 reduces apoptosis so that these molluscum are trying to live as hard as possible. And finally, MC53 and MC54 neutralize interleukin-18 and that prevents interferon gamma production, which is essential for viral destruction. There is a lot of symptomatology with molluscum and everybody says, oh, you know, not a big deal. It'll go away. Well, you know, two years of misery is not is not necessarily a good thing for kids. Um, so pruritus is very uh, has, has been reported in 14 percent inflammation. Same same numbers. Dermatitis uh, can be upwards of 60 percent, depending on the studies. Um, impetigo and superinfection, again, up to 29% in some studies, conjunctivitis and pain. There really are kids who have pain. I have seen kids admitted into the hospital for uh, suspected abscesses when the molluscum get giant. Um, and, and they can be a lot of downside uh, to untreated molluscum infections. Here's our peak age of molluscum uh, so around the world. Um, so we're looking at uh, months, basically, and uh, when we look at uh, age and months, um, it seems like the average is about four and a half years. And one of the reasons we see some variation in the studies is that some studies report kids based on the first onset of their lesions, so, such as mine, it's the one at the end, uh, right, uh, just before the average, New York, uh, Silverberg. So for, here we go, a little more than four years of from uh, in terms of the uh, age of onset um, versus these studies like this one, which looked at the kids on the day they arrived in your office. And often that's going to be 12 to 24 months later. So just something to consider. Peak age of, a, uh, in, of molluscum seems to overlap quite, uh, quite a lot with, the, with atopy. Um, and that may be why molluscum has been more more common in our practices, but on the other hand, molluscum can trigger atopic dermatitis. So the appearance of molluscum in younger kids may be the cause of some of our increase in the atopic dermatitis in the general population. Um, and we're seeing that across the board. So again, peak age and months of um, of molluscum um, and A to P is quite, can be quite similar depending on the location. If we add in some exposures such as family members and outside contacts, we have a good reason why molluscum is occurring at certain time periods. Um, but essentially um, a lot of times what we're seeing is that the school age child is giving it to the preschooler or vice versa. And, and that may account for why there are multiple peaks. Um, what we do see also here is this data reported in Native Americans, uh, and similar data has been discussed uh, for um, Aboriginal patients in Australia, and conceptually, there may be some uh, concern for molluscum occurring earlier uh, and being associated with more untreated dermatitis uh, in populations that have poor access to care uh, and low income. Again, more conditions to think about, uh, impetigo bacterial infections, and here's scabies, again, a marker of a poor population that has poor resources. Um, so things we, we think about in our practices on a daily basis. 
Um, meloscum is common in younger kids, um, so it's co more common today. But um, when we look at first graders versus sixth graders, right, we can see, um, you know, there's a little peak here if uh, still at, in first grade, but drops off by sixth grade uh, in Japan. Um, and then same thing for Native Americans, uh, common in uh, less than one uh, and one to four years. Molluscum is really itchy. Um, it can trigger new onset atopic dermatitis. It can trigger sustained atopic dermatitis flaring or increased severity. Um, and AD patients have more molluscum lesions and more dermatitis. Uh, MCV can trigger AD, molluscum dermatitis, but also id reactions. So again, here's some more data in, uh, in, in different uh, locations, thinking about um, studies that have reported A to P in their, in their patient population. And you can see here ranges any place from uh, the mid 30s uh, up until 60%. Congenital transmission has been reported in molluscum. So 30% of kids less than six months have molluscum antibodies, and that protects them if mom has molluscum. Um, but we have seen reporting of molluscum on the scalp. And this is a case series that I, I did years ago um, with, with um, the late, great uh, Arnold Duranji. Um, looking at our cases of congenital molluscum, and all of them occurring really on the scalp, um, in areas that would be perceived to be in contact with uh, either the uh, cervix or coming through the birth canal. Other forms of horizontal transmission also are uh, sexual transmission, so common infection in teenagers, um, the groin area, including genitalia, buttocks, lower abdomen, and inner thighs. Uh, we should look for co-infections with other STDs, um, and uh, th this is really super common now in younger patients, 15 to 24. The natural history, again, of molluscum is about half are gone at 12 months and 70% at 18 months. Uh, so there is something good on the horizon, uh, but we do have to counsel our patients. Um, and what's interesting is, again, when we look at older studies, sometimes they underreport the time it took to clear. Um, because they looked at when the patient came into the office um, and how long it took to clear after treatment. Um, and the reality is, is that if you really look at well, your patients and you address the time that the disease started until the end, it's really about two years to get everybody clear um, versus the data that looks at patients who are coming into our offices uh, many of whom are waiting many months to see a pediatric dermatologist. Molluscum can cause poor quality of life. It can be cosmetically disfiguring. It certainly causes parental anxiety. And 82% of parents reported that molluscum contagiosum concerned them moderately or greatly. Uh, there is a stress of many therapeutic sessions. You know, ultimately, many parents are um, of a belief that will clear the lesions instantly. Uh, and the fact is that we need to wait for the body to meet us halfway. So we do the destruction of the lesions, um, but the body has to form immune response. Uh, and even when we do immunotherapy type treatments, we still have to wait months until the body's uh, immune response is fully harnessed. Some of the other issues with kids are exclusions from sports and pool activities, which is a quality of life indicator, uh, and self-consciousness and embarrassment um, and of course, uh, wearing long shorts and long sleeve swim shirts sometimes helps kids hide these lesions and also make them less contagious. Therapy for molluscum, uh, and I know that's reviewed in the next section, um, but we really have to think about our therapies uh, by dividing them up. Some really common therapies we use in the office are curatage, which requires topical lidocaine-based products or lidocaine prilocaine combo. Um, which of course can be associated with pain. Certainly a lot of bleeding in the office when, when you scrape molluscum. Uh, and there is a potential for scarring. We do have to be careful not to go very deeply um, considering that molluscum are often very soft and, and do come off more easily. Um, cryotherapy, uh, and, and of course, I'm, I am gonna go back a second to this curatage because ultimately um, it's not a great idea for eyelids or, or locations where a child might move. It, it's quite dangerous um, if you think that a child might move and have damage to a vital organ. Uh, cryotherapy is widely available. It causes pain and there is a potential for discoloration, particularly in darker skinned kids. 
Um, and then we have topical retinoids, uh, which have been described as uh, low efficacy, but easy access. Uh, they do cause irritation, which is uh, kind of intended to uh, force them to shrivel up and fall off. Um, but that irritation can be disabling in an atopic. And finally, there were some, uh, there have been discussions of miquimod uh, for molluscum. And in clinical trials, the agent had concerning side effects, um, but the trial was designed to have usage of three packets, up to three packets per day. Um, and there have been other trials looking at extremely limited usage, one packet two or three times a week. Um, and there was some partial reduction in lesions, but again, concerning side effects um, with the original clinical trial, which unfortunately the company never published and it's rather hard to find it online. Again, majority of kids are young, they want painless therapies um, and painless options are needed. And I, I thank you all for listening. Thank you so much to Dr. Nanette Silverberg for this enlightening presentation. Please stay tuned for the second episode of this Molluska mini-series with Dr. Adelaide Hebert, available right now. I would also like to extend our gratitude to Novan for sponsoring this program. If you have questions about molluscum or this presentation, please email us at info at